My name is Pirita Frigren. I'm from the University of Turku, Finland. I work there as a senior lecturer in cultural heritage studies. I'm a historian from my background uh, and I'm concentrating on 19th century and early uh, 20th century maritime and social and women's history. Um, in my PhD thesis that I defended in 2016, I studied uh, 19th century uh, sailors, wives and widows and how did they manage their life and livelihood during the long voyages while their husbands were away for years even. And uh, this was sort of like uh, doing research on those who were left behind. And this is where I found uh, the charity organizations and religious Protestant Siemens mission movement that worked abroad for seafarers and for migrants. I found many women who worked for this Siemens mission operations abroad and uh, I got really interested to particularly to Siemens missions priests wives how they worked on the field like as an unpaid uh, workers and they were sort of migrants themselves but they were migrants working for migrants you could say. Well if you look at the late 19th century and early 20th century that era witnessed the dramatic shift from sail to steamships. My name is Julia Stryker and I study at the University of Texas at Austin. I study the expansion of women's labor at sea in the 19th century British Empire and its relationship to things like regulation and legal change, uh, the invention of leisure travel, the development of steam, health and safety at sea, and migration. So what happens in the 19th century is that the conditions of labor and life at sea change due to the rise of steam, such that women become a more visible part of a maritime labor force. Uh, ships began to change. They um, eventually designated that all ships had to separate the sexes. And when they did that, all of a sudden you needed a dedicated labor force to navigate the space of the ship for each different sex. And this really drove the professionalization of women's labor at sea. Women were employed primarily to assist other women, uh, although they did do other things aboard ship. In the 19th century, they became specified towards helping other women navigate the space of the ship, taking care of them, making sure that they uh, were behaving well, as well as living well. So maintaining healthy quarters, helping them dress, that kind of stuff. The big deal about steamships is, of course, they're less controlled by the weather. They can sort of go wherever they need to go as long as they can fuel. So that meant that the labor force itself also changed its lifestyle. Uh, they were able to have a more regular place where they lived because they would always come back to the same port and they would always go out to the same port. So it really allowed the integration of seafaring labor into sort of land-based bourgeois values. Uh, so, you know, domesticity, male breadwinning, all of these things became things that were not only more popular, but more possible with seafaring labor. Um, and women's role in that was, in a way, making it so that these ships were places that women could exist. So it's a sort of ironic study because it means that, right, women become professional laborers aboard ships in order to make ships place that place, places acceptable for women who are supposed to be at home, right? they create a domestic space aboard the ship. In the 19th century, it was a big deal that it had to be white women or white British women serving in these positions because it was part of civilizing the space of the ship, which was a job primarily for white women. But as it moved to a more service-oriented position and became kind of demoted from controlling the space of the ship to serving passengers, uh, it, became, it became a greater employer of women from colonized places. 
My name is Alexandra Yingst, and I am a PhD student in Global Studies at the University of Iceland in Reykjavik, Iceland. I'm looking at what characterizes life at sea on board a cruise ship. And for this project, I'm looking at how gender, but also nationality and race, intersect to determine the experiences that people have on board a cruise ship, both in the workplace, but also socially. The majority of seafarers in the world are from the Philippines. And it is socially expected as well as economically necessary in many cases for people, particularly women, to go abroad to find work. Floating communities with a global clientele, these cruise ships, um, they, they are environments that mimic and sometimes even amplify existing social norms and social roles that exist on land. More men than women work on board cruise ships. Women are the ones who still have the responsibility to be in touch with their children. And that's because with Wi-Fi on board ships now and the, uh, the ability to video chat and send emails or text messages to home, women are able to work at sea and support their family financially from afar, but are able to every day talk to their children and be mothers. So not only are they doing a lot of labor on board cruise ships that is, um, it's very emotionally laborious, but they also have to deal with the emotions of their children and their families back home. And so they, um, they have a lot going on when they're working at sea. There are a lot of women that are moving into more traditional masculine roles aboard ship. Um, but it's still quite a fight because the erasure of the history of women's labor at sea has led to the idea that women don't belong on ships. And we're still very much fighting that idea. Often women have to change their behavior and appearance to fit in and to be one of the guys, really. And this is problematic because women are unable to act like themselves on board the ship. And if they want to become an officer, which is something that more and more women are doing nowadays, but it, there still are a lot of barriers for women to work in an officer position or to even become a captain, they, they have to kind of lose their themselves and they have to act like one of the men on board. Today, more and more women are working on board, even as uh, ship officers, captains. Uh, although it's hard to find women on these positions in the past, I think this has motivated historians to look at the maritime past and seek for women in different kind of positions in maritime context, for example, as ship owners, uh, even as a seafarers themselves, as fishers, and uh, in different kind of uh, jobs that women did in ports uh, in order to maintain a uh, shipping business. And also I think it's because of the environmental crisis that we are now looking at not only those who went at seas, but all the people who lived by the sea and took their livelihood out of sea and like sort of tried to to cope and maintain their everyday life uh, by the seaside. Women's migration is sort of a secondary concern in migration. Women's labor is not even considered a thing that happened, not even a thing that existed. So our memory of it is really this sort of tinted idea that at the turn of the 20th century, this new technology came in uh, on these big, glorious, beautiful ships that allowed women to move into seafaring spaces as laborers, uh, when that's not really true. They had been there for a long time. They just weren't recognized. They weren't recorded in the same way. It's also very important to bring women's stories, both in the past and today, to light. And that could be through museum exhibits, through articles, through books. And I really think that women at sea should be celebrated because it's a fascinating world for these women to go into and their stories are so unique and so interesting. 
if you travel to any, let's say, any port city in the world, it's easy to find these female statues looking at the horizon, looking at the sea. And uh, these statues and other monuments, they usually commemorate the maritime history of, of the place and how it used to be very much a female community when, when men went at seas to earn, uh, earn the living. And often they also commemorate the catastrophes that take, took place at seas, shipwrecks and accidents and other kind of uh, issues. Uh, but then again, if I, look, uh, if I think about the memory of those women who actually worked at sea, or in ports, it is their fragments in the archives, in the sources, in the museums, and all the historical research that we have made that maybe is the most visible memory of them. And we should do that even more and more. <laughs> Thank you.